All right, ladies and gentlemen, today is our last day before the test. So we are hustling real hard today. So everyone needs to have their notebook and a whiteboard. Tomorrow, you have a test, 26 minutes, focus, pieces, and your map. I'm just going to collect your map tomorrow. So your map is still due. I'm just collecting it tomorrow just so we can get to content faster. I hope that's okay with you. Sounds good? All right. Questions, concerns, comments about tomorrow? Everyone knows they have a test tomorrow, yes? Perfect. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what is it called when neither side gets an advantage? Fighting in trenches means that they're fighting over the same 90 feet every day. This leads to crazy high death counts. What is it, Brian? Stalemate. On your whiteboard, what is the term we use for our simply surviving and waiting for the other side to break. It starts with an A. What is it called? It's the wearing down of resource, resources and will until eventually one team breaks. What is it, Evan? Attrition. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what do we call the side of the war that's covered in trenches? What do we call the side of the war that has over 2,500 miles of trenches? What do we call it? Good. Madison. Western. Western Front. The Western Front is between what two countries? Good. What do we got, Sam? On your whiteboard, we have a much more mobile war located where? What do we call it when we have a much more mobile war? Good. Lauren? Eastern Front. Eastern Front. Eastern Front is located where? It's between what two countries? Good. Maggie? Germany and Russia. Germany and Russia. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the ship that the Germans sink using unrestricted submarine warfare. This is the first major attack on the United States. It almost brings us to war, but it does not bring us to war. Tess, Lusitania. the Lusitania. Did we get to the U.S. declaring war? No? Okay, so we got to Lusitania though, yes? No? no? Oh shit, where are you people? All right. Okay, so we know that the United States were uh, were neutral, but we were doing none of the neutrality part, yes? Okay, so we are smuggling in guns and weapons into England, okay? And the Germans implemented an unrestricted submarine warfare that says that they will kill anyone or shoot down any uh, uh, ship going into England, okay? Alright, so, so America is heading, so, unrestricted submarine warfare, so we have the Lusitania, unrestricted submarine warfare, do you have that down on your notes? Okay, unrestricted submarine warfare is going to justify the Germans sinking the passenger ship, the Lusitania, you absolutely need to know that term, it is right here, the Lusitania, how to spell it? right there. Now, the Lusitania was a, a British passenger ship. You don't need to know this specifically, but it had only 128 U.S. citizens. But when the Germans hit it with the torpedo, if it was just a normal ship, it would blow a hole in the, uh, in the ship, would have killed some people, but the ship would have gone down slowly. It would have sunk. Like the Titanic. What do you think Titanic how it goes down slowly? Uh, it blew up completely. Like, pow! So what does that mean was at the bottom of it? Bombs, ammunition, and stuff like that. So were the Americans smuggling? Oh, you bet your bottom belt. Okay? It almost pulls the U.S. into World War I. You do need to acknowledge it, but it does not pull us into World War II. Oh, World War I. Okay? So, what does pull us in is the Zimmerman Telegraph. Okay? So, the Zimmerman Telegraph. Zimmerman is spelled right here. Okay, Zimmerman Telegraph will pull the United States into World War I. Okay, 
you need to know that it is between Mexico and Germany. It is between Mexico and Germany. So if the United States knows about it, and it's between Mexico and Germany, what were we doing? We were spying, of course. Are we spying today in 2020? Yes. Is, are they spying on us? Yes, of course we're spying. They're spying on us too. Okay. You need to know that Germany promises Mexico, California, New Mexico, Arizona, and Texas. Germany promises Mexico, Southeast, uh, Southwest America is fine. You want to write Southwest America. Promises Mexico, Southwest America, if Mexico invades the southern border of the U.S. Why would they want Mexico to invade the southern border? It makes logical sense. Why would they want Mexico to invade the southern border of the United States? Janet? Uh, not really, because they knew the United States was going to eventually join. Look, I mean, they've been sending bombs for how long now? Sam? No, or it opens a two-front war. And guess what really stops fighting? A two-front war. So if the United States has to fight on two fronts, can they throw all of their efforts into Europe? No. So... They wanted to have the uh, Mexicans open a second front against the United States to weaken the United States. The United States intercept this. You don't have to write this down. We intercept it. We immediately send troops. The Mexicans never invade. So nothing ever happens. However, the United States immediately declares war on April 2nd, 1917. I don't care if you memorize April 2nd. You need to know that it's 1917. Is everyone clear on that? Hello? Okay, I don't care if you know it's April 2nd, but I do need you to know it's 1917. So, the United States. So, the Lusitania is the first straw, but the final straw is, of course, the Zimmerman Telegraph, and we declare war on Germany. We actually have it. This is what it looks like. Break the code. It tells them. Okay? So, Mexico, if they invaded, they would definitely get that. If they did a really great job, um, Germany was going to give them all of that. All right, so... Home front is your next heading. Home front is your next heading. Okay, you need to know that World War I is the first total war. It's the first total war, and you need to underline total war. That is an important term. Okay, total war means every country's resources, economy, and people. Total war means every country's resources, economy, and people are committed to fight the war. So, that means every single person's life is touched. Now, we've been fighting in Afghanistan for 17 years. Is that a total war? Now, could you go weeks without thinking about Afghanistan? Yes. Now, does that mean every American can do that? No, absolutely not. We have, our, we have families here right now in 2020 who have family in Afghanistan who are worried every moment of every single day, correct? However, is the whole country? No. There's only two times in the world that we've had a total war, and what are they? There you go. World War One and World War Two. Everything stops during World War One in order to fight. If it was a total war right now going on, we're in World War Three right now. We would have half days of school. You know that, right? You come to school for a half day, and then all the women if we're doing typically stereotypical things. All the women would go to the hospitals, and we would roll bandages, clean, help the men in all the hospitals here, especially in Tampa Bay. All the men would go around and collect scrap metal, or uh, because you're old enough, you would go to essentially soldier camps, where because you're under the age of 18, you would learn how to march, how to shoot a gun, how to do long hikes that would get you in shape. So when you did turn 18, you can immediately be shipped out. Does that make sense? So it'd be half days. Yeah. Right now, there are more people in America than back then. Like every every single thing. Gas prices are up. Food prices are up. Every single aspect of your life is changing. 
So every every single person has to do whatever you say? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Well, you would do it in shifts, of course, because some people can't because they have family and, you know, family responsibilities and stuff like that. If your mom gets sent overseas, stuff like that. It just depends. All right, so what you need to know is that we start having rationing. Rationing. Okay, food rations, which means we limit the amount of food people can buy so that more people can eat. We limit the amount of food people can buy so the more people can eat. <coughs> Why do we have to limit the amount of food people can buy? Why? Shannon? Yes, we need to, rationing occurs because we have to send food to the troops. Okay, so we limit how much consumers can purchase so we can send more to our troops. So without rationing, one lady can come in and buy all the cans and families are starving. With rationing, all families can eat and we can send food to the troops. Rationing has only happened twice here in the United States. We've only had total war twice in the United States. Okay? Here's just some uh, major propaganda. Uncle Sam shows up during World War I. He was so successful. They bring him back in two. Here's the British equivalent. Okay, you know, they straight up ask at the bottom of this propaganda piece, Daddy, what did you do during the Great War? <laughs> and they don't want you to be like, man, I stayed home, and, you know, so trying to guilt. Okay, so total war, you need to know rationing, um, that's good. All right, uh, complications in Russia, you know, setting. Okay. Complications in Russia with the rising death toll. And no resources in the country. Civil unrest begins in March 1917. Civil unrest begins, no resources in the country. Civil unrest begins in March 1917 in Russia. What does that mean when I say civil unrest? What does that mean, Maggie? It means like they weren't happy with the government. Yeah, people are starting to fight back against the government. They're going to burn down government buildings, disrupt services, stuff like that. Okay. So, what is going to happen is Tsar Nicholas II is going to step down from power. Tsar Nicholas II is going to step down from power. Is that a big deal? There you go. Okay, so during that time, a guy named, and you should have his full name down, Vladimir, I don't need his middle name, Vladimir Lenin rises into power. Vladimir Lenin rises into power. He is, he is a communist. We're going to put communist in quotes because he's not a real communist. He's a pretty good communist, though. There's some really bad communists out there. Like Stalin is not a communist. He is not a communist at all in none of the words. But Lenin actually did believe that he was there. Okay, so... He is a communist. You need to know that Lenin, it is Lenin who signs the Treaty of Brest Litovsk, whatever. <laughs> Vladimir Lenin signs a treaty of Brest Litovsk with Germany to get Russia out of World War I. So the treaty is right here. The treaty. So it is Lenin who signs a treaty with Germany saying, hey, we got to go. And Germany's like, yeah, you, you really should. Why do you think Germany was happy to watch uh, Russia walk away? Why? Sterling. So, um, they to continue to send their troops to fight them. Yeah, and where they, like, and, like, they must have felt a little guilty. Like, just the pure amount of death. Like, they just piled up over there. I mean, kind of guilty because they're Germans, you know what I mean? But, like, 
Okay, so, Treaty of brest Liptov, which is going to end, get Germany, uh, get Russia out of the war in 1917. So who joins the war in 1917? Who leaves the war in 1917? There you go. So you need to know, 1917, we have a revolving door. In come the Americans, out go the... There you go. So here it is. So, the first... Here's Lenin. Here are the people in Russia overthrowing. Okay, so March 1918. So, um, the end of the war. It should be your next heading. End of the war. End of World War One. Okay, so March 1918. Okay, is the last major battles of World War One. major battles of World War One, and they are supported and supplied by the United States. They are supported and supplied by the United States. We will overwhelm and win. Why will we overwhelm? Why? There's two different reasons why the United States overwhelmed. Why? All right. Yeah, and so how are our men? Weak or strong? strong? Strong, hell yeah, we got fat men, remember? They called them doughboys. Is it because we were like super fat Americans at the time, or is it when we were just fat, normal, and everyone else was super scar starved and skinny? We were normal, we were normal size, everyone else was super skinny because of fighting in the war for three years, does that make sense? Okay, so our men were stronger and our factories were completely intact. Do you think all the factories in Europe are intact? No, our factories were intact so we could outbuild them. Okay, so the end of the war, the end of the war happens on November 9th, 1918. November, oh no, November 11th, November 11th, I need you to memorize that thing. November 11th, 19 is when Kaiser will have a second so time. November 11th, 1918 is the last day of the war. Ladies and gentlemen, what is November 11th called today? It used to be called Armistice Day, but now it's called Veterans Day. Okay, because it used to be called Armistice Day, and Armistice Day, Armistice Day is the peace of all peace. Guess what didn't stand long? Peace of all peace, because we know what's coming. Two. So, it's not just called Veterans Day. Okay, so November 11th comes to an end. You, England, France, and the United States are the victors. Germany loses. England, France, and the United States. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you need to know that 8.5 million soldiers die. 8.5 million soldiers. Isn't that insane? 8.5 million soldiers die. 16 million civilians die. Isn't that insane? As you can see, who is losing the most? Russia. Okay. Alright. So, the end of the war. So, uh, you're going to write Treaty of Versailles. Okay. And the major players are going to be Woodrow Wilson. From the United States. You need to know that. <coughs> okay, and then you have, uh, I need you to know David Lloyd George from Great Britain. And then you can uh, acknowledge that France is involved. I know, like if you 
couldn't tell. If I had Vittoro or Lando, you couldn't tell me what country that guy's from. Clemency, whatever that hell that one is, you couldn't tell me what country that guy's from. Come on, now. Okay, this is what the four of them look like. Can you tell me what country that guy's from? No, that's Italy. Look at that pizzazz, look at that hair. What? That's Italian. Okay, that's Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> Tommy, that man doesn't have style. Okay, so, ladies and gentlemen, you need to know 14 points. It's non negotiable. The Treaty of Versailles is made up of what we call the 14 points. Made up of what we call the 14 points. You need to know that one through four call to an end to secret treaties. Reduce national armies. Call uh, self self uh, self rule. It's when all countries should be controlled by their own people. What is that called? Huh? Anyway. Okay. Anyway. Um, self determination. Self determination is five. And then the 14th point, which you need to know, is a general assembly of nations <laughs> a general assembly of nations, and it is called, not the UN, League of Nations, League of nations. you need to know that. The 14th point is the creation of the League of Nations. Okay, so major aspects of the Treaty of Versailles. So the Treaty of Versailles is made up of the 14 points, but there's a couple things that you absolutely need to know. So you're right, major aspects of the Treaty of Versailles. You need to know that it blames Germany for the entire war. Major aspects of the Treaty of Versailles. It blames Germany for the entire war. Ladies and gentlemen, was it all Germany's fault? No. Okay, so it blames Germany for the entire war. It's called the War Guilt Clause. You need to know that. It blames Germany for the entire war. It's called the War Guilt Clause. Okay, then Germany has to pay reparations. Reparations are right here. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the exact causes that will cause World War II. Do you think we're going to talk about this 10,000 times? Yes, so you might as well learn it now. So you have the War Guild Clause, which means Germany has to take responsibility for all of World War I. It wasn't their fault, but they had to take responsibility for it. Then they have to pay reparations to the Allies. They owe all of these countries money as a, I'm sorry. Is that fair? Nope. <laughs> they are also going to take away the Rhineland from Germany. Give it to France. They take away the Rhineland. Rhineland. No more Germany. Now France's. Why is it important? It's like the breadbasket of Germany. What does that mean if it's the breadbasket of Germany? Yeah, it's where all their wheat comes from. And guess what? Every country needs a lot of wheat. So are they taking uh, uh, good land or bad land from Germany? Where do you think the first thing Hitler's going to invade when he gets a large army? Rhineland. Absolutely, because he got screwed. 
Okay, so you need to know the Rhineland is taken away. You need to know that Germany cannot have an air force or a military. Can you imagine a country without a military? Does that make it safe or completely dangerous for them? Hello? It's dangerous. Absolutely. So what do you think the first thing Hitler does when he comes into power? Builds up his military. Guess what the first thing every country is doing after World War I? Making an air force. Guess what is the only country that's not allowed to do it? Does that put them behind? Does that make them safer or weaker? Weaker, absolutely. Okay. Do, do, do. All right. Do, 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 do. Okay. Other things you need to know. Russia is completely excluded from all negotiations. Why is, uh, why is Russia not included in the negotiations even though they lose the most people? Because they bailed. So America, England, and France is like, hey, Russia, you left early. You don't get shit. How do you think Russia feels? Now, I would write that down. The Russians are pissed. So in World War II, what team did they originally pick? Germany or America? Germany. Why? Because the Americans screwed them over. And they were like, screw you, America. And guess what? Do you think that's going to go away throughout the war? No, it's not. Because immediately after World War II, we go into the Cold War. Yeah, so why do the Ameri why do the Russians hate Americans to start? We screwed them over in the Treaty of Versailles. We cut them out, even though they lost more people. Italy is also excluded. Italy gets nothing. Why does Italy get nothing, Tess? There you go. They jump teams, so they don't get anything. So guess who's super pissed? There you go. I would acknowledge that because that's going to lead to a guy called Mussolini coming into power and saying, you know what? Screw America. Screw England. Screw France. Let's talk about this thing called fascism. Okay. In the uh, League of Nations, Germany and Russia are not included. <laughs> League of Nations, Germany and Russia are not included. Why don't they include Germany? Yeah, they caused the war, and you're in quotes, they caused the war. Did Germany cause the war, people? No. Okay. Why isn't Russia involved? Because they're communists, and they don't want to deal with communists. So that's why. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, what two countries should have absolutely been in the League of Nations? Germany and Russia. Because where is where the shit going down the most? Germany and Russia. Yeah. All right. That is your end of World War One. The Treaty of Versailles, ladies and gentlemen, is a huge deal. Next week, that's all we're talking about. Here we go. Back to Russia. Are we ready? Let's do it. So we got to clean up some details. So Russian Revolution is what your heading is. So we happen to know that a revolution happened, and that's why Russia leaves World War One. Now we're actually going to talk about that revolution. So Revo uh, Russian Revolution. You need to know... I love the Russian Revolution. I'm going to do it in like four minutes. Do you know what really sucks? Just teaching the Russian Revolution like six minutes. Okay, here we go. So the Russian Revolution. If I'm writing it down, are you writing it down? Yes. There you go. Russian Revolution. The first stage. The first one is Bloody Sunday. Okay, Bloody Sunday. This is when Tsar, I'm going to write Nick the Second, but you know it's Nicholas, yes? yes. Okay, Tsar Nicholas the Second shoots into the crowd outside Winter Palace. This is 
1905. Okay, so the first aspect of the Russian Revolution is Bloody Sunday. Okay, and that happens when Tsar Nicholas II shoots into the crowd of the Winter Palace. It's protesting industrialization. Industrial. So, okay, this is Tsar Nicholas II and his family. This is Tsar Nicholas II, and that's his wife, Katerina, okay? Uh, this chick, you all know who she is? Anastasia. Yeah, she's the one who goes missing, but she's alive. She's dead. She's dead. Sorry. There's no way. This is Alexi. He's super sick. These are the three daughters, uh, the four, three other daughters. They all get massacred in a basement. But they survive for a while. They get shot at like 30 times in the body. Because you don't shoot women in the face, can we agree? You shoot them in the torso. Well, they had all their diamonds sewed into their clothing. Because they're like one of the wealthiest families in the world. They had diamonds sewed into their clothing so they could conceal it. So no one would steal their diamonds in the wealth in case they could get away. And, um, well, bullets came. Great. So there was just bullets like ricocheting in the basement. And they wouldn't die. So eventually they just had to be executed. And that's how they die. We're kind of jumping ahead, but here we go. <laughs> I just thought you should know that. Okay, so at least I got your attention now. So we know the first major thing is Bloody Sunday. Okay? So the second major event, this is uh so your next major event is World War II. One. I'm just kidding. World War One. Tsar Nicholas the second drags unprepared Russia into, into it. People slash soldiers. Okay, so third major event is the March Revolution. March Revolution. This is in nineteen seventeen. You need to know that. Okay? Tsar Nicholas II steps down. Steps down. Okay? And the Duma, which is a uh, legislative body, takes over. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Russia is it known for its democratic players? No. So, do you think this new, brand new legislative body was ready to rule Russia? Do you think it was set up for success? No. So, it is obviously going to fail. So, Tsar Nicholas II, he steps down. Okay? He's still alive at this point. So, he's like kicking it, you know, in his previous star life, okay? Then you have the Bolshevik Revolution. Bolshevik Revolution. This is also in 1917, but it is after the March Revolution. This is when you have Vladimir Lenin. Absolutely need to know that name. Vladimir Lenin overthrows the Duma to take control over Russia. Now, ladies and gentlemen, did he overthrow Tsar Nicholas II? No. Tsar Nicholas II has already stepped down. Then we have this legislative body that has never had any power that has literally been a puppet around for like 10 years of the time to take over and has never had any authority over anything in power. So is it as impressive that he took it over? 
No, absolutely not. Alexa, if I'm up here doing this, you sure as hell ain't doing that. That's for sure. Okay, so the Bolshevik Revolution is also happening in 1917. This is going to turn Russia communist. This is when you have the communism. We're going to get into it in much more detail. Okay, so here is Lenin. This is the Bolshevik Revolution. Okay. Okay, so as soon as we have the Bolshevik Revolution, immediately we have the uh, Russian Civil War. Okay, so we have the Reds. Who, who, who do you think were wearing red? Communists, yes? Communists, and who leads the communists? Lenin versus the white. Which are, um, they are going to be pro, uh, pro democracy. And they are going to be called the Mensheviks. So we got the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. Don't you love Russian heritage? Bolsheviks and Mensheviks. Okay, so we have the Russian Civil War, and it is going to rage. Okay, and it is going to rage for four years. Okay, I think it ends. Yeah, it rages for four years. Okay, so it goes for four years. More people, <coughs> more Russians die in civil war than during World War I. So ladies and gentlemen, let's just look at the death count of Russia right now. Okay? They lost eight, uh, almost 10 million people in World War I. The soldiers and civilians back home. They are going to lose almost 12 million during the Russian Civil War. So, if you're doing the math, that's almost 22 million people dead in a span of six years. Yeah. Because it's so big. <laughs> yes, so you need to know that during the Russian Civil War, it's four years more Russians died in the Civil War than during World War I, you need to know that Lenin gets Russia out of World War One during this time. So, during the Russian Civil War, which is four years, which you should know is 1918 to 1922. Who's the winner? The Reds. The Bolsheviks win. Bolsheviks win. Okay. Okay. Bolsheviks win. Lenin dies. Lenin dies. Okay, and then we have the sixth stage is the rise of Joseph Stalin. Isn't it fascinating? I know, like, this is like the most abridged, and you don't even know the details, you don't even know the crazy shit. Like, for instance, Joseph Stalin was so strong and such a big dude that he could literally lift you by your throat and have you off the ground and choke you to death. Could you imagine just being like... And will hold you while you're, like, hitting him and all like that, and he would just stare at you and just squish your esophagus until you died. Did that test question? <laughs> That's a light question. Like, if you could do one cool thing, what would it be? I would like to be able to grab someone by the esophagus, lift them off the ground, and even with them hitting me and like wiggling. Could you? Could you imagine being that guy? You 
walk into any room and be like, I'm happy to be rough. It would be insane. It would be insane. So, the rise of Joseph Stalin, what you do need to know is he's the guy who does the five year plan. He's the guy who does the five year plan. He industrializes Russia. He industrializes Russia with a five-year plan. <laughs> so, the guy who can choke anyone by lifting them is also the guy who can do the Industrial Revolution. Okay, so that's Stalin, in case you didn't know, and that's Lenin. Okay, you need to know. It's not cute. Lenin hated him. Lenin would never have picked him. Lenin, you need to know that Lenin, for your differences, Lenin is the first communist leader. He's your first communist leader. He is a true believer. He is a true believer. Okay? He really does believe in Karl Marx. True believer in Karl Marx's vision. Okay? He really does believe it. Then you have Stalin. Guess what? He is your second communist leader. And guess what he doesn't believe in? Hello? What do you, I'm laughing. What do you think he doesn't believe in? He doesn't believe in communism. He is not communist. He is not a communist, but uses it to create an authoritarian regime. So he calls himself a communist, but guess what? That man definitely is not. Yeah, you think that man over there, the guy who can lift you and choke you, wants to see you as an equal? No, no, he does not want to be considered equal to you. That's it. Okay. So the rise of Joseph Stalin, the five-year plan, he industrializes Russia. Okay, you need to know that he is not a communist, uh, a communist, but he's in fact an authoritarian. Okay, um, and who do we fight with in World War II? Who do we fight with in World War II? Joseph Stalin. Who are we fighting against in the Cold War? Oh my god, guys, we're like calling through content right here. On your whiteboard. You could be one amazing dude from history. With the ability to come to you. On your whiteboard. <laughs> On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of uh, the treaty that ends World War One. Good, what is it? Reagan. Who was forced into the well, uh, war guilt clause? Who was forced into the war guilt clause? Good. Shannon. Germany. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what is it called when you have to pay money to other countries? Starts with an R. Good. Alexa. Reparations. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what is the name of the dude who loses power in the March Revolution? What is the name of the dude who loses power in the March Revolution? Maggie. Sorry, Nicholas II. On your whiteboard, who rises into power during the Bolshevik? You can just shout it at me. Lenin. Lenin. Have a good day, guys. That was a lot. <laughs> That's a lot, but at least it's cool, right? Hello? Yes. Oh, my God, you people. Just.